Friday when you are doing your exam. If you take the anatomy of the orbit, first you have to describe, you have correctly described about the uh, shape of the orbit like a pyramid with the opening in the front and then the cone going behind. But uh, this is a symmetrical paired structure separated by the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. And there are seven bones which form the orbit on each side. These bones are frontal. So you need not remember all the orbital projection of palatine, orbital projection of maxilla, orbital like that. It's so that for the examination sake, if you remember these seven bones, frontal, sphenoid, maxillary, zygomatic, palatine, ethmoid, and lacrimal. These are the seven bones contributing to the formation of the orbital, bony orbital cavity. So the roof is formed by the lesser wing of sphenoid and the frontal bone. So there are two bones which are involved on the formation of the roof, lesser wing of sphenoid and frontal bone. The lateral wall comprises of greater wing of sphenoid bone and zygomatic bone. So roof and lateral wall. So you can remember rula, RO for uh, roof and the la for lateral wall. So the mnemonic you can remember is rula made up of two bones each, of which you can remember both the lesser wing and greater wing of the inner country group. And you can remember that upper area should be definitely by frontal and lateral by the zygomatic. So these two bones on each side form the <coughs> contribute to the formation of two and central wall. The medial orbital wall comprising of lacrimal, ethmoid, maxillary, and lesser wing of sphenoid. Again, lesser wing of sphenoid has got a contribution to the medial orbital wall also. There are also four bones involved in that. And the orbital floor comprises of maxillary, palatine, and zygomatic bones. So there are three bones. So roof and lateral, two bones. Orbital floor and medial, three and four each. So if you remember that, totally there are seven bones contributing to the formation. So the walls of the orbit function as a physical barrier from throwing the eye from getting injured, mm. the anchor of muscles and ligaments to attach, traditionally serve as a window for neurovascular structures to travel through. This is what the orbit does. And the connective tissue structures within the orbit aid in support and protection of the orbital contents. The orbital fat which surrounds the extraocular muscles and globe itself serves as a cushion and facilitate movement of the eye. This fat increases in size and grave disease. And the cause for that is prosthosis. So sometimes when the grave disease comes under control with the anti-thyroid medications, sometimes the prosthosis still remains. So the oculoplastic surgeons, they remove part of this fat to reduce this prosthosis and give the patient a better vision. So that is the importance of this orbital fat. And the orbital septum is a connective tissue structure that acts as an anterior border between the facial skin and fat and the orbital contents, impeding the spread of infection into the orbit. So this is all about the key points which you have to remember. So if you <coughs> remember the Anatomy of the sphenoid bone. So all of you would have just seen, it does not start in detail during your anatomy day. This is the green color is the lesser wing, the brown color is the greater wing, and this is the body. The yellow thing is the pterygoid process. So these two structures they contribute more to the formation of the orbit. So this is the lesser wing, it contributes to the a roof as well as the medial wall and the lateral wall is formed by the greater wing and the zygoma and uh, these are all the various <coughs> structures which form the orbital cavity so you see the frontal bone coming here and there is the sphenoid bone which uh, 
not the fit, then the rhizomatic process is here, which contributes to the lateral wall. This is the maxilla, it's the palatine bone, lacrimal, ethmoid. All these things form the medial. So the whole structure is formed. And blood supply is by the external artery, is a branch of internal carotid that crosses through the optic canal of the sphenoid bone. And the intraorbital artery, a branch of maxillary artery, and the intraorbital vein drains into the plexus, courses through the inferior orbital fissure into the intraorbital canal alongside. Superior and inferior ophthalmic veins course through the superior orbital fissure. The eyelids and bulbar conjunctiva use the orbital lymphatic system to drain the periarticular nerve. So, this is how the <coughs> branch of ophthalmic branch of the from the internal carotid goes. It gives all the major supplies like lacrimal, psychomatical central, and the, the orbital entire almost every supply to the, within the orbit is by, by the ophthalmic artery. And this runs along with the optic nerve. So, there is all possibility that uh, any of the branches could be punctured when you try to do a block. So, you have to be pretty sure uh, in injecting and that uh, make sure that you don't puncture and aspirate before giving the drug. And this is the venous <coughs> drainage, and uh, it can see the connection to the cavernous sinus. So, it, uh, any infection. I should not be taken lightly because it can go and travel into the central vein and the cavernous sinus also can be infected and intra <coughs> cranial infection can happen. This central retinal vein can get occluded by compression and positioning. So, one of the causes of post uh, operative blindness. <coughs> venous and arterial occlusion. Now, that, <coughs> now which are there in the hospital cavity, now the branch of trigeminal well, provides sensation to the maxillary region of the face, working anteriorly <coughs> from the interior of the tissue. And the cranial nerves, two, three, four, uh, five, and six branches of five and six, all come into the <coughs> A bit. The optic canal is located medially to the superior artery fissure, which transfers the optic nerve. So, this is how the, <coughs> the uh, optic foramen through which the optic nerve and the optal artery comes to so the superior artery fissure. And see the <coughs> lacrimal nerve, which is a branch of the frontal nerve, superior optal vein. <coughs> Fourth cranial nerve, third cranial nerve, and necessarily it's all these nerves coming through the superior orbit here towards the, inside the orbit. And the muscles, the levator palpebrae superioris, which is mean muscle to elevate your upper eyelid, which receives nerve supply from C3, that is the trochlear nerve or the cranial nerve 3, which elevates the upper eyelid. That, is superior to the superior rectus muscle at the roof of the orbit, and these two muscles join in form an aponeurosis anterior. Why this anatomy is important? Because this intimate muscular relationship explains why the eye elevates as the upper eyelid is retracted. And this is why third nerve palsy also results in ptosis. It is the, the eyelid will start drooping. And the extraocular muscles, their actions are uh, four recti and two oblique muscles which are there. Uh, so, superior rectus elevates and adducts and rotates medially. Medial rectus adducts only. Inferior rectus depresses, adducts and rotates laterally. Lateral rectus abducts. So, there is only one abductor, but there are two adductors. That is superior and medial rectus. Or adductor because this knowledge is important when doing any spin procedures. <coughs> you know, it may be a convergent spin or a divergent spin. So the surgeon should be able to correctly identify the palsied muscle and then try to <coughs> that 
to correct this thing uh, two oblique muscles superior oblique uh, also depresses and abducts rotates medially inferior oblique elevates abducts and rotates laterally so this is how the recti means straight so all the recti are straight muscles you see this is the lateral rectus and this is the medial rectus this is the superior inferior four recti muscles are there they are the oblique muscles are called oblique because they come and make a turn and then they attach to the globe so this is the inferior oblique and this is the superior oblique which is called the turn which is called the trochlea <coughs> And this is the uh, attachment with the levator superior part, uh, superioris, with the superior oblique muscle. So this attachment only causes the elevation of the eye and the upper eyelid is corrected. In the palsies of the third nerve, you will find both the superior oblique muscle also will be not acting, and the eye will have a down and out movement. So. The clinical significance: facial veins communicate directly with all ophthalmic veins. They serve as a conduit for infection from the face towards the cavity sinus. Fractures that extend into the optic canal can lead to hemorrhage from the ophthalmic artery, or blindness can be uh, caused by injury to optic nerve. Patients with a down and out gaze, down and out gaze, may have ophthalmic motor palsy. third nerve palsy this is how the eyeball will look when there is a third nerve palsy <clears throat> and this is how the process also will happen so you can see this i mean this uh, grouping and when you open the eye you can see the eyeball is looking outward and downward and patients unable to abduct their eyes may have lateral rectus or superior nerve palsy so this is the Normal eye, and this is the eye which is converged to the median because the yeah. lateral element is not working. So the eye looks converged towards the midline. And with your your surgeries are varied and are <coughs> managed by mostly uh, there are mainly two types: vitreectomy and the retinal correction. So for vitreectomy, what they do is They put in a light source inside, then there is a vitreactor which can remove or cut the vitreous, which is a jelly-like thing. So it is mainly done for any uh, bleeding and fire-related area which blocks the vision. So they have to remove that or the transmission of light to occur and fall on the retina. So it is a procedure which is done by piercing the globe to all the layers through this. Then they keep on irrigating inside to remove whatever material has been aspirated to <coughs> to be removed and suicide and then aspirated. So that is how the treatment is done. And the clearal buckling procedure is done for the correction of the detachment of the retina. It is done an external procedure. So you can see this is the retina which has got detached from its attachment here. And so, in order to replace it back, what they do is they remove part of the globe, tighten it so that this separated portion will fall back onto the surface and get itself attached to it. So this is, and uh, this is the basis of the steel buckle. How they do? They cut a small portion of the steel and then suture it to tighten the globe <coughs> so that this uh, excess. The uh, folding will be uh, stretched out and brought back to the normal position. So, interrupting <clears throat> surgery may be performed using regional techniques or even optical, but the factors which govern that are patient <coughs> suitability, surgeon and anesthetic preference. So, it is traditionally earlier days it was. Can be performed under general anesthesia, but nowadays local is becoming more popular. People having surgery under general anesthesia usually are, as I said, as I said, it's the younger generation, which can tell the years who are very uncomfortable with local alarm. They keep moving their eyes because sometimes the anesthesia is not there. 
and I read in anesthetic should always be pain free, which is not some systemic or local complication. It should be cost effective and to facilitate a stress free procedure for surgeon and patient alike. And majority can be performed under regional techniques. All types of anesthesia, like topical, subsection table, vitro bulba, peri bulba, and even subtle non anesthesia and patient nerve blocks, all have been tried. And Found to be quite useful. And major complications <coughs> of the regional technique are scleral perforation, retrobal bar hemorrhage, optic nerve injury, slow ischemia, aplocardiac reflex, and brainstem anesthesia. For general anesthesia, the challenges need to be <coughs> we have to prevent the IOP during laryngoscopy and intubation, prevention of aplocardiac reflex, we need to monitor the dark. In the darkness of the world, sometimes they switch off, as I said, all the lights. And prevention of increase in the size of the hexafluorocarbon bubble by avoiding nitric oxide, and prevention of post operative nausea and vomiting. To this, you can add the uh, prone position or lateral position, which the surgeon may request during surgery, in the, especially in retinal detachment surgeries. So, just to put it as a bullet point. Or what are the requirements of the oral surgery? You require an immobile eye, congested eye, decreased intraocular pressure, smooth recovery, and avoidance of post operative nausea and vomiting. After governing IOP or stress tumor, increased tumor, blood within the eye, clearly compliance, and extraocular muscle tone. <coughs> this is just a request from a dynamics ultrafiltration of plasma by CD APTM. Formation of aqueous tumor in PJD process. <clears throat> aqueous tumor circulates around the iris and uh, pupil, comes to the anterior chamber, goes to the canal of phlegm, trabecular spaces of Montana, drains through the epistereal venous system. Sometimes this may be a short note to this, so that's not uh, <clears throat> the circulation. Just like the tears of circulation, comparing to the tears of circulation. This is also an ultrafiltration by the plasma epithelium, after plasma by epithelium, ultimately <coughs> draining through the epistleral veins. Drugs which can reduce this tumor production are acetolamide, beta blockers, and antibiotics, and nucleotics. They will affect the drainage because they will shorten the <clears throat> and then which proves the training methods. So that's the, that is all what I want to say about this the orbital anatomy. So whatever points that you find it extra in this, you can add on to your answer. But otherwise, uh, whatever you have prepared is, is sufficient and you can add these additional points to improve the presentation. Okay. Anything else anybody wants to contribute? Hello? Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. One problem with this online class, you are not getting a reply immediately. <laughs> How much shall we go to the next topic? Yeah. Sir, good evening, sir. Who is it? So this is Dr. Muthumani, sir. Yeah. Dr. Muthumani, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Sir, my yes, question okay. is, describe the functional classification of anesthesia breathing circuits and describe the Humphrey ADE circuits. Sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm starting with anesthesia breathing circuits, sir. Okay. Definition, breathing circuit is an interface which connects patient's airway to the anesthesia machine, creating an artificial atmosphere through which the patient breathes. Function of breathing circuits, 
delivery of oxygen and anesthetic gases and elimination of carbon dioxide, components of breathing circuits, fresh gas entry port, reservoir bag, corrugator tube, expiratory valve or adjustable pressure limiting valve, carbon dioxide absorber, patient connecting port and bacterial HME filter. Requirements. There are two requirements, essential requirements and the desirable requirements. Essential requirements, deliver gases to alveoli in concentration, same as set concentration, effectively eliminates carbon dioxide, have minimal dead, apparatus dead space, low resistance. Desirable requirements, economy of fresh gases, conservation of heat, humidification of inspired gases, lightweight, in, lightweight convenient and efficient during controlled and spontaneous ventilation, adaptable to for both children and adults. Provision to reduce OT pollution. There are various number of classification systems. Uh, they are McMohan classification, Drips classification, Miller's classification, Moyers classification, Collins classification, Conway classification and ISO classification. McMohan's classification. Uh, they are open circuit, semi-closed circuit and closed circuit. In open circuit, there is no rebreathing. In semi-closed circuit, partial rebreathing is there and in closed circuit, total rebreathing. DRIPS classified the anesthesia breathing circuit into open, semi-open, semi-closed and closed circuit depends on the presence or absence of reservoir bag, rebreathing, directional valves and carbon dioxide absorption. They are open circuit, example open drop and TPs, semi-open, example TPs with small reservoirs such as Jackson Reese circuit, semi-closed, example Mapleson circuit and closed circuit, example Brains Ward circle system. Miller's classification. They are divided into two systems without carbon dioxide absorbent and systems with carbon dioxide absorbent. Systems without carbon dioxide absorbent, there are in that there is two types unidirectional flow, which is non breathing, non rebreathing system and circle system. Bidirectional flow, afferent reservoir system such as Mapleson A, Mapleson B, and Mapleson C and LAC system. Efferent reservoir system, Mapleson D, Mapleson E, Mapleson F and Bain system. Enclosed afferent reservoir system, Miller's and combined system, Humphrey ADE, ADE breathing system. Systems with carbon dioxide absorbent and the unidirectional flow is circle systems with absorber and the Bain's word circle system and bidirectional flow is water's to and fro system. In Mapleson's, Mapleson's breathing circuit, Based on the amount of fresh gas flow needed to prevent rebreathing, they are divided, they are classified, uh, and the fresh gas flow requirement depends on the fresh gas flow requirement. How they are classified into Mapleson A circuit, which requires one time of patient's minute volume, and Mapleson B and C, C circuit, it requires 1.5 to 2 times of patient minute volume. In Mapleson D, E, and F circuit, it requires 2 to 3 times of patient's minute volume. We will see about Mapleson circuit. In Mapleson A circuit, also known as Megill circuit, most efficient circuit for spontaneous ventilation and least efficient circuit for controlled ventilation, the fresh gas flow needed is 60 to 80 ml per kg per minute. Lax circuit, which is the coaxial modification of Mapleson's A circuit. In coaxial system, the inspiratory, the, the, the gas in the inspiratory limb is warmed by gases in the expiratory limb. And Mapleson B and C circuit are obsolete now. Mapleson D circuit, which is most efficient for controlled ventilation, and the fresh gas flow which is required is 150 to 200 ml per kg per minute. Brain circuit, which is a modified coaxial version of Mapleson D circuit, which is 180 centimeter long. It has two tubes. One is outer tube, which is 22 millimeter in diameter, and the inner tube, which is 7 millimeter in diameter. Mapleson E circuit, which is higher TPs. It is a valveless bagless circuit, Mapleson F, which is Jackson and Reese modification of IRS TPs, which is effective for both spontaneous and controlled ventilation in children less than 20 kg. Sir, second question Humphrey ADE anesthesia breathing system. Sir. It was first created by David Humphrey in 1982. It is a versatile breathing system that combines the advantage of Mapleson A, D, and E systems. It is efficient for both controlled and spontaneous ventilation and it can be used for both adult and children. Very commonly used for veterinary anesthesia involving both smaller and larger animals. It consists of two smooth bore tubings connected proximally to Humphrey block and distally a Y connector to the patient. One tube delivers fresh gas flow and other carries exhaled gases. 
also consist of adjustable pressure limiting valve, expiratory valve, reservoir bag and lever to change mode either to spontaneous or controlled ventilation. With the lever up, it resembles Mapleson A circuit used for spontaneous ventilation which includes reservoir bag and adjustable pressure limiting valve in the system. With the lever down, it switches to controlled ventilation which resembles Mapleson E circuit which includes ventilator in the system and excludes reservoir bag and APL valve from the system. So that's all.